Today on the Matt Wall Show, an award-winning student of the sciences tries to debate Ben Shapiro about gender ideology, and the resulting footage shows us everything wrong with academia, the sciences, and gender ideology. Also, a black supremacist commits a terrorist attack on New York. There is a definite trend here that uh, the media, of course, doesn't want to talk about, but we will. Plus, a teacher puts on a drag show for students, and popular YouTubers face vicious backlash for comparing abortion to the Holocaust. They're right, of course, but they weren't right when they apologize. We'll talk about all that and more today on The Matt Wall Show. You know, if you've been listening to my show for a while, you're probably familiar with one of our top sponsors, Rock Auto. Recently, my producer McKenna told me about her own experience shopping with Rock Auto and how great it was for her uh, as a person who knows nothing about cars. It's a riveting story, so let me tell you about it. McKenna was carpooling with her boyfriend during an ice storm and turn on his windshield wipers before he got in the car to help get rid of the ice. But with this simple act, she destroyed his windshield wipers and they had to drive in the rain with wipers that barely could wipe the rain away. Uh, during the drive to work, she figured it was worth checking rockauto.com to see if they had replacement options for the windshield wipers. And sure enough, she was able to buy some new windshield wipers for the car that are made to deal with ice and for a surprisingly reasonable price. So if you're like McKenna and need a quick fix or if you need to do some major repairs, you should check out rockauto.com. Once you go to rockauto.com, a list will guide you through every single make and model and you could you, know, you could possibly imagine and you'll find everything that you need at rockauto.com. It gives you a list of every part available for your vehicle. Included with the part descriptions are photos and specs so you can feel confident that you're choosing the correct parts. So go to rockauto.com for your auto part needs today and write Walsh in their How Did You Hear About Us box so they know that I'm the one that sent you. That's rockauto.com to shop for your auto part needs today. So I noticed last night that Ben Shapiro was trending on social media, and as I clicked on his name to find out what he had done this time, I immediately learned from many left-wing accounts that he had been apparently totally owned and demolished and destroyed in a debate with a college student during the Q&A portion of his speech at UNC Greensboro this week. Now, I confess that I was, uh, I was a little biased, maybe, but I was skeptical of this claim for many obvious reasons. Then I went and watched the trending video in question, and I discovered that my skepticism was certainly justified, to put it mildly. More than that, in fact, the exchange encapsulates nearly everything that's wrong with the left's approach to debate in general and debate about gender ideology in particular. These flaws are only further underscored by the fact that the left is hailing and applauding the college student in spite of the fact that he, by any objective measure, and speaking now scientifically, made an absolute ass of himself. But don't take my word for it. Let's, uh, let's go to the tape and watch some of this. I'm a mathematician and a physicist here, a double major, and I also just won the most prestigious award in the country to pursue research at any institution I want, That's the National place. Science Foundation Graduate Research Fellowship. So I think I'm pretty you know, qualified to say that most of what you're saying is based on like old data. Um, but my question to you, I and so I want you all to like, realize last that. Month, but sure. um, like, for example, gender identity disorder, that's the DSM-4, bro. We use the DSM-5 now for psychologists to be able to talk about- I literally about cited the DSM-5 in the speech, and it's called gender dysphoria, which is I the term that I use throughout the speech, not gender identity disorder. You sound like disorder, a bozo, bro. And you get no disorder. and you can't even make your wife bro, so what's good? Now, a couple of things here before we uh, watch the rest of the clip. First of all, the kid makes a number of false and confused claims right off the bat, but rather than let Ben correct the record, he interrupts, calls Ben a bozo because those are the insults that kids are using these days, apparently, and makes an obscene comment about uh, Ben's wife. Now, we saw how Will Smith reacted to a comment about his own wife, and we saw that Smith was largely defended by the left for reacting that way, but Chris Rock didn't deserve to be smacked in the face for making such an incredibly mild joke. This cut, on the other hand, actually does deserve the Chris Rock treatment. I mean, you don't talk about a man's wife that way. I understand why Ben didn't climb down from the stage and up into the stands and try to commit assault during the YAF event, of course, but my point is simply that this is a kid who needs to learn to watch his mouth. I mean, something has gone seriously wrong in society when a young man feels comfortable speaking that way to another man about that man's wife. And one of these days, he's going to run his mouth to someone who is not standing on stage with cameras all around, and he'll learn his manners the hard way. Also, before devolving in almost immediately into ad hominems, he begins by listing his credentials. The credentials are, of course, completely irrelevant to the conversation and will not make his wrongness magically right. Um, and that's not to say that he's lying about the credentials, though. The most concerning and disturbing thing is that he is not, apparently. The North State Journal, a newspaper in North Carolina, they looked into this, and here's what they found. Quote, 
One UNCG student who got to ask a question boasted about being a mathematician and a physicist and recently winning a prestigious National Science Foundation Graduate Research Fellowship Award. The fellowship, which is uh, NSF says is the oldest graduate fellowship of its kind, spans five years, including three years of an annual stipend of $34,000 and a cost of education allowance of $12,000 paid to the institution. A search of the awardee list located four students, but only one individual, Quentin Hosea Merritt, matched the questioner's description and received an award in physics and astronomy, quantum information science for 2022. North State Journal reached out to UNCG for comment, but did not receive a response by publication time. Additionally, the Twitter account for the physics department limited who can see their tweets after our reporter questioned them about merit. So apparently the kid with the bad haircut who thinks you're a bozo is an argument and who accuses a father of three of being a virgin and who thinks women have penises and who couldn't even be bothered to wear a shirt to the event has indeed received a prestigious academic award. Now, rather than this fact causing us to see the stupid kid in a better light, it should cause us to see academia in an even worse light than we did before, which, frankly, in my case, I didn't think was possible. Now, let's return to the clip and see what else Sideshow Bob has to say. So, number one, uh, let me just say, the nice thing about having the question, several small the children real question is I don't feel is, the necessity if, to have my masculinity If we're using a Western like colonial you. idea of gender, then why should it apply? If we're using, because the gender binary is a Western colonial, is a Western colonialist framework of gender. You're you right. Know? Men and women don't exist in any other culture. No, 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 no. I'm, no. Think right. about Native American. Nailed it. Third gender people. I'm not saying that. Third gender people exist in Native American societies, Western African societies, like Southern Native American societies, like Mexico. So in other places that are not white dominated, and they like are the United incorrect. States or Europe. And so, so you're saying, saying white, so non-white people, I'm a mathematician and a physicist. You cannot so tell what me. The, so I have a question. And also you're not a biologist. So I have a question. I'm 20. As a mathematician and a physicist, what in the hell do you know about human biology? And you got your law degree from Harvard. What do you know about biology? You got your law degree from Harvard. And frankly, and frankly, I would ask another question. If your logic is so flawed as a mathematician and a physicist, I would suggest that whichever institution gave you an award, revoke it immediately. I'm a mathematician and a physicist, he screams while making one erroneous and incoherent claim after another. He says that ge the gender binary is a Western colonial idea. Now, even if this were an accurate claim, if it were somehow true that Western colonialists were the first ones to realize that men and women exist, that wouldn't in and of itself disprove the gender binary. On the contrary, in fact, it would just be one more great and true thing that Western colonialists introduced to the world. It'd be another W for Western colonialism, I guess. But sadly, uh, Western colonialism cannot claim credit for that. The so-called gender binary is as old as humanity itself. It is decidedly not true at all, even a little, that non-Western countries have an idea of human sex that falls outside of the binary. In fact, every non-Western society on Earth and in the history of the Earth believes that there are only males and females. And I defy you to provide an actual example of an exception to that rule. Now, they may, in some cases, have some version of cross-dressing or, or you know, what we would call gender bending or whatever, but um, they don't believe that men can actually be women. The claim made by this leftist and by almost every leftist is the idea that, um, is the, is that, you know, the idea that, that men have penises is uniquely Western. Now, if that were true, you should be able to travel outside of the Western world and find hundreds of cultures that believe women can have penises, but you don't find that. In fact, you don't find any cultures outside of the Western world that believe that. I should know. I actually went to Africa and investigated this question. You'll see what I discovered in my documentary, What is a Woman, when it's released in May. You go to whatisawoman.com and see the teaser for that. For now, suffice it to say that this kid is uh, full of something, and it ain't knowledge. I can tell you that. He mentions Native American cultures. This is a reference to the two spirits, quote unquote, which is allegedly the Native American version of transgenderism. They put it into the LGBT alphabet thing now and they put it in there. Um, so it's LGBT, QIA, 2, S, whatever. Um, the problem is that the term two spirit was invented in 1990 by LGBT activists. That's how far back ancient Native American history of 1990 is when they came up with this. It is itself a modern Western concept. And that's the theme here, if you'll notice. 
And it's an important thing to point out, actually. It is gender ideology, not the gender binary, that is modern and Western. Gender ideology was invented in the West by Westerners very recently. Western liberals have taken this idea and tried to spread it throughout the world. That is the sort of colonization that happens these days. Gender ideology, it turns out, is not only modern and Western, but also, in its own way, colonialist. The worst kind of colonialism. This is the ideological colonialism. As the left, as, as you know, liberals in the West try to ideologically colonize the globe. They may not be planting the flag of, of a nation, although that happens as well, but no, instead they plant the gay pride flag. And that's the kind of colonization that happens. So this kid was um, on exactly the opposite side of the truth. Upside down, backwards, incoherent, angry, stupid, confused, and yet an award-winning academic. It is terrifying to consider how often all of those things tend to go, to go together. Now let's get to our five headlines. Well, I, uh, I did mention ever so seamlessly the, uh, my documentary, which is coming up, uh, What is a Woman? Again, you can go to whatiswoman.com and see the teaser for that. For that. And uh, that's one of the things I, I, you know, I was just thinking about watching that clip of this um, kid is just, okay, wait, like, we'll, we'll see, okay? You, you, you can make these claims about other cultures in the world. Have you actually gone there and asked them, I did, and you'll see how they respond. You'll see. I don't think you're going to like it very much. Uh, but that is, you know, as you know, that documentary and the book that's coming out as well, which you can pre-order on Amazon, is what makes me, I mean, this, that kid was, a, was a, an award-winning physicist, he, he claims. Um, but I am an award-winning women's studies scholar. And before that, as you know, I was an award-winning, um, awards that I basically give myself, LGBT author with my book, Johnny the Walrus. And if you have not... Um, pre-ordered Johnny the Walrus yet, and these, these books will actually be shipping very, very soon, I promise. You can still go to Amazon and, and uh, order Johnny the Walrus, or go to johnnythewalrus.com and get my um, award-winning LGBT children's book. So you should do that right now. Okay, we'll start with this from the Daily Mail. A multi-state manhunt is currently underway for the person of interest suspected of unleashing hell on a Brooklyn subway train during Tuesday's morning commute. As a gunman fired more than 20 rounds, leaving 10 riders wounded and 13 others injured in the ensuing chaos before his automatic weapon jammed. The NYPD released photos of Frank James, 62, who rented an abandoned U-Haul that's linked to the shooting scene and who has made concerning, quote-unquote, threats against New York City Mayor, Mayor uh, Eric Adams and railed against the city's homelessness crisis. Um, commuters on the N train Tuesday morning describe how a man wearing a construction vest threw a smoke grenade into their subway car when it was in between stations and then opened fire. Terrified passengers tried to get onto the next carriage with the doors locked. When the train pulled into the 36th Street station in Sunset Park, the gunman fled um, and managed to escape in the middle of New York City and is still right now at large. Now, there is more about the suspect that is relevant that we should talk about. But before we get there, um, Kathy Hochul, the governor, you know, she was on the scene very quickly. And instead, the first thing she wanted to talk about, of course, is, well, you, we, we, we can already know, we already know where she's going to go with this, but let's watch the clip anyway. So this is an active shooter situation right now in the city of New York. I just got off the phone with the mayor. He's recovering well, he is monitoring, he's actively engaged in the situation. I wanted to let him know that the people of the entire state of New York stand with the people of this city, this community, and we say no more. No more mass shootings. No more disrupting lives. No more creating heartbreak for people just trying to live their lives as normal New Yorkers. It has to end and it ends now. And we are sick and tired of reading headlines about crime, whether they're mass shootings or the loss of a teenage girl or a 13-year-old. It has to stop. I'm committing the full resources of our state to fight this surge of crime, this insanity that is seizing our city because we want to get back to normal. 
And it's been a long, hard two years. That's what we crave, that sense of stability and normalcy. And this is what the mayor and I are going to continue to work toward. And I thank the partners, the brave people of the MTA, the first ones who had the sense, the drivers of the train, to leave the station to make sure no more victims could be hurt. The NYPD, FDNY, state police, everyone involved in this has one purpose, and has to stop the insanity of these crimes. You'll hear now from our fire department. I want to thank them for being there to help us defuse a volatile situation. But we'll be giving continued reports as this day unfolds. Again, we ask everyone to be careful, be cautious, report what you see. These, these people are so incompetent. And of course, Kathy Hochul is not going to be able to rise to a moment like this because she's just a perpetually failed politician who's managed to fail her way up and uh, ended up with, with the governorship without being elected to it. So she's totally unprepared for this. And she's rambling basically incoherently. What is it? We're, we're tired of the insanity of these crimes in the last two years. The last two years? What? You roping COVID into it? What does that have to do with anything? And then uh, she's no more mass shootings. Of course, that is her gesturing towards in a not so subtle way, gun control. And uh, she's allowing the media and everybody else on the left to make that connection more explicit, which of course they did right away. This is why we need gun control. Um, even though they already have strict gun laws in New York, and that obviously did not prevent this from happening. And you know, the other thing too is, is um, this scumbag is still on the loose right now. Okay, he's still out there. He's at large at right, right now. And, and at the, certainly at the time when that speech was given. So, we don't want to hear right now about your plans to stop mass shootings in general. What about this specific situation? What do you have for that? Because we know that what they always want to do is they want to make it about gun control. They want to use, they want to use every crisis to their political benefit, of course. Um, but the other thing that happens in the midst of that is that we take these specific situations, which had specific causes and which need to be addressed in specific ways, and then you, you, you broaden it, and you turn it into this kind of abstract thing of what are we going to do about mass shootings and just like violence in general? Now, before we hear, instead of immediately going to that, why don't you tell us how you're going to catch this actual guy who's on the loose? Because that should be your first uh, priority. And... Actually, the first priority before catching him would have been to stop him from doing it in the first place, which it seems like you should have been able to do because um, as is so often the case with these um, mass mass killers, or in this case, attempt, attempted killers, he was known to law enforcement. So journalist Andy No has some more information about Frank James and just reading from his Twitter thread where he's compiling a lot of this stuff. And, uh, you know, and bringing things to light that the media does, of course, is not, is not going to tell us about. Would prefer if we didn't know. But this is what Andy has. He says, um, NYPD named Frank James as a person of interest in the Brooklyn mass shooting. I looked into a social media like the Waukesha suspect and the Louisville BLM activist who allegedly tried to assassinate a mayoral candidate. He appeared to be a fan of black nationalism. Uh, and then he's got a whole bunch of posts from this guy. I mean, Frank James was all over social media. He was all over YouTube being very explicit about the fact that he's, you know, about his, his racist uh, feelings about white people and also his violent tendencies and the fact that he wanted to kill people. Um, says, Frank James, the Brooklyn mass shooting person of interest, made disturbing posts recently suggesting he was going to kill people. Um, uh, some more social media posts by, by Frank James. And just, there's a, a whole bunch of posts of him talking about how he wants to kill people. He hates white people. And there's also, as I said, he had a YouTube channel where he was... Um, pretty open about the fact that he despised white people. So here's just one, one example of one of the, uh, one of this guy's, uh, YouTube videos where he's complaining about the fact that Kentanji Jackson married a white man. Let's watch this. I had no idea with that African name that she would be married to a white man. One of my subscribers brought that to my attention. Yeah. Our black sister, Supreme court justice, Power to the people is married to a white man. She's fucking bitches. 
I don't believe this shit. Oh God. Wait a minute. This this is the motherfucker right there. We there is right. White man. Black sister. Ketanja Tay. What the fuck is that? Married to a white man. Okay, so there's that. There's there's also a video that uh, Andy No posted of. We don't need to play, but he's he's walking down the street in New York City and just shouting at white people, and also Asian people as well, um, just kind of shouting at them and calling them all evil and and racial slurs and all the rest of it. So now, um, uh, so we know that this is a very clear from his social media posts. This is a black supremacist hated white people. Didn't just hate white people. Hated Asian people too. Hated um, everyone who's not black. Also hated other black people as well, it would seem. And that's that's the thing that the media right now is homing in on. So this is, we, we just played that for you. You've, you've seen some of the social media posts. Here's CNN, okay? Now this is like at the level of, of self-parody. The CNN had an article where they say that the killer or the suspected killer was uh, had videos which were racist and misogynistic. But here's what they say about that. Um, many of the videos that James uploaded included references to violence, including a, at a set group of people he believed had maligned him, in addition to broad societal and racial groups that he appeared to hate. The speech was a common theme throughout James's videos in which he repeatedly espoused hatred toward African Americans. That's the only specific racial hatred that CNN acknowledges is that he hated black people. He was a black guy. The fact that almost all of his posts were very directly targeted at I hate white people and I wish they were dead doesn't get a mention from CNN. So this guy was known to the FBI, was threatening to kill people, made many racist videos and posts with with oftentimes violent themes, and yet was not apprehended by law enforcement ahead of time. And wasn't even kicked off of social media. I mean, I can't say that a male swimmer is a man without getting kicked off. This guy could post videos of himself walking down the street and screaming about how he hates white people. Not kicked off of social media. But you do notice a trend here. We got the the Waukesha mass killing. was a black supremacist. This guy is a black supremacist. Um, the, uh, The attempted... Uh, assassin of a mayoral, mayoral candidate in Louisville, black supremacist, Capitol Police officer killed last year, black supremacist. Now, does this matter? I mean, is it, is it worth talking about? It is. Because first of all, it's true. It's just a, it's a fact about these crimes. And, and it's a fact people deserve to know. Um, it's also, of course, if this had gone the other way and this was a white guy ranting about non-white people, then we know the media would have all this stuff all over the place. But then also it's important because this is not like a random pattern. It's, it's not a coincidence. I don't see how it's a coincidence that we live in a culture right now where it is acceptable to hate white people and kids are having this, have even at, at very young ages, are having this uh, ingrained into their minds that white people are evil and responsible for all the evils in the world. There is this constant fomenting of hatred towards white people, and not just hatred, but also paranoia um, about, about, about white people. And then what do you see? You see these mass violent crimes targeting white people. M- might we draw a connection? Is it possible that, that, that these things are being encouraged and that people who are already mentally unbalanced, they're hearing, hearing all of this stuff? about how white people are, are evil and they're being given a, a welcoming environment to express and kind of dive deeper into their own hatreds. Might we draw that connection? I think we can. Well, we can. But um, uh, for, from on, on a mainstream level, it, 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 the connection isn't going to happen because this story is going to fall out of the headlines. It's already on its way out of the headlines a day later. And I can guarantee you by, by the end of the week, by the end of the week, unless there's some new update, they catch the guy or something, but barring that, 
by the end of the week, this is not even on, it's not even on the homepage of CNN. And, and that's, and I'm being optimistic by saying it'll take to the end of the week. Probably by later today, if not tomorrow, it's gone. I mean, look at the Waukesha kill, uh, uh, terrorist attack. Many people were killed in that attack. Thank God so far, no one's died here. And they were able to erase that in 24 hours. A child was killed, run over by a car during a parade. 24 hours later, it's like it never happened. So that's what they're going to do here because they don't—they have no interest in talking about um, the mainstreaming of anti-white hatred and how that might be contributing to these kinds of violent events. They don't want to talk about that. And also people in the media, they don't really care if white people are the victims of, of violence. It's, that's just, it's not, they're not concerned about that. All right, this is from the Daily Wire. Last week, um, high schoolers in a Wisconsin town not far from Madison had to endure a, sing- a song and dance routine by a French teacher from their school who was dressed in drag. Uh, Shannon Valladolid, the di- di- uh, district's director of information public relations, reportedly admitted that um, staff performances are vetted by the high school's teaching faculty. French teacher Matthew Cashton, whose LinkedIn page states he is looking to shift away from K-12 public education into higher education to study abroad in programming and advising, performed for the students during Middleton High School's Fine Arts Week. Uh, Empower Wisconsin reported, quote, Cashton strutted onto the auditorium stage in a high-cut blue sequined dress, red boots, and a blonde wig, lip-syncing and dancing to Rain On Me by pop divas Lady Gaga and Ariana Grande. It was all a surprise to the assembled students who apparently had no idea that they are about to get a drag show from one of their teachers. And we have footage of that. Let's play just a little bit of that, that footage. All right, so it's just a male teacher in drag, strutting around in front of his uh, minor students. No, no problem there at all. And this is how, I mean, just think about how, like, the aside from the, the perversion and the degeneracy involved here, just the the gold, the, the, the gall and the bolt. Can we turn this off? Just turn it off. I can't, I can't look at it anymore. The gall and the gumption to do this, to do it at all, but especially to do it right now, when everybody's talking about grooming in the public schools, and and for once there's actually kind of some national focus on that issue, and the left is busy saying, "Oh, it's not happening at all," and then you decide to do a drag performance that you it's apparently vetted by the administration. They saw this plan and said, "Well, oh, yeah, sounds good. Let's do that." Obviously, knowing that this video is going to end up end up online, it's not going it's not going to be a secret. Nothing is, especially not that. But they don't, speaking of not caring, they, they just don't care. From the school system, their attitude is, hey, these are, these are our kids, not yours. You can complain about it all you want. What are you going to do? Pull your kids out and homeschool them? Uh, I, we know most of you probably won't, so complain all you want. That's their attitude. A uh, Middleton Cross Plains Area School's parent alerted radio host Vicki McKenna in an email about this, writing, quote, I send my children to school and entrust them to... Um, Teachers that I have to believe are professionals who won't destroy their innocence for their own pleasure. If Matthew Cashton makes a decision to perform his drag show at school, what else does he do in the classroom with a room full of children? What kind of educators thought this was appropriate? Drag shows are fine arts. If a teacher is a pole dancer or a stripper, can they also perform for my children? I don't care what Matthew Cashton does outside of school. I do care what he does at Middleton High School. And that is a, a very good question as well. If he's doing this on camera, on stage, what does he do? Like, if he's willing to do that on stage with everybody watching, and when he must know that there's probably with people with their phones out, what is he doing in the classroom when, when he's not on stage? And when he's pretty confident that he's not being filmed? This is, um, yeah, grooming in the public school system? Definitely. Sexual abuse in the public school system. Because I hope that um, the conversation, as we're talking about grooming and gender ideology and indoctrination of students, a very important issue, 
But I hope that it, and I think we're, we're starting to see this now, that the conversation also starts to include a very related issue, which is the sex abuse epidemic in schools. Because the fact is that our schools, as I have been screaming for years, and up until recently, like nobody seemed to care, our schools are crawling with sex predators, uh, with, with perverts. And there's a reason why these people want so desperately to talk to kids about, about sex. I mean, there's no reason why you would want to put on f- women's clothes and strut around on stage in front of, uh, in front of kids other than you're, you're a predator. And this has been a problem in the school system for years and for decades. There was, as I've mentioned, as you, maybe you've heard me mention before, there was a study commissioned by the Department of Education back in 2004, I believe, which back then found that one in 10 public school students uh, were targets of sexual misconduct by teachers. Now, that works out to about 5 million victims at any given time. And this was a Department of Education. This isn't uh, some right-wing propaganda outlet. This is the, the Department of Education did their own study and said, yeah, this is a problem. Back in 2004, they were at least willing to be honest about it. It's probably not the case now. Um, so that's 5 million victims there, about 4 to 5 million victims. And out of that number, 3 million experienced actual sexual assault. You know, sexual misconduct, that includes sexual harassment, inappropriate conversations between teachers and students, which is bad enough. But it also includes actual physical sexual assault by teachers. And uh, if you look at those numbers from the Department of Education, that's about 3 million victims. Which means the epidemic in our schools is at least 100 times worse than the scandal in the Catholic Church. Although it's gotten 100 times less attention. And those numbers are for, from over 15 years ago. Do we think that it's gotten better magically since then? I mean, when, when you have a sexual abuse crisis in an institution and you don't do anything about it and you ignore it, and instead you start taking abusers and you move them around to different schools and everything, does the problem tend to get better on its own? No, it doesn't. It's like... If you if you have a you know if you find a lump somewhere on your body and you just decide to ignore it and hope it goes away, it's not going to. That's that's not how a cancer works. It's just going to progress unless you address the problem aggressively. And it's the same thing with the cancer in the public school system. And that that's only that's only uh, talking about abuse by teachers, abuse by students of other students as a whole is its own its own crisis. We know what happened at Loudoun County. The AP, again, back when um, some of these institutions were willing to be a little bit honest about this, the AP did a, a, a report on this a few years ago. And at that time, they found that set, there was 17,000 cases just at that time of student-on-student abuse in a, in a four-year period leading up to that report. And a lot of those stories are, as we've seen in Loudoun County, are downright horrific. And we know the schools have done a manifestly terrible job of handling these cases. Sometimes they even cover them up. What else can you expect? There are, there are hundreds of deviants and perverts working in the system. This is a real problem. An actual epidemic. And that's why every, every day you can go online, you see another story of sex abuse in the public school system. Uh, the Post Millennial, for example, just from a couple of days ago, they've compiled uh, four more cases, recent cases, of teachers charged with sexual abuse of minors. There was a case in California, 56-year-old math teacher, um, faces allegations of sexual assault from at least two students. In Florida, 30-year-old Thomas Dean, former teacher at a private school, um, faces lewd and uh, molestation of a minor. And that was back in February. There's an English teacher in Iowa, faces multiple rounds of charges of sexual exploitation by a school employee. And in North Carolina, 27-year-old Sean Hicks, was science teacher at Harnett Central Middle School, Um, faces three charges of indecent liberties with a student and is jailed on a $50,000 bond. And there was also, this is the most recent one, in Oregon, middle school teacher arrested, charged with sexual abuse and incest. In San Jose, jury issues $102 million reward, blames school district for not stopping teacher sex abuse. This is an an, an epidemic and it's, and you know, there's 50 million kids 
in the school system who are in, in the potential pool of victims. Maybe at some point we might start talking about it. All right, this is from CNN. It says, Oklahoma Republican Governor Kevin uh, Stitt on Tuesday signed a bill into law that makes performing an abortion illegal in the state, with an exception only in the case of a medical emergency. Uh, the governor said in a statement, as a governor, I represent all four, four million Oklahomans, and they overwhelmingly support protecting life in the state of Oklahoma. We want Oklahoma to be the most pro-life state in the country. We want to outlaw abortion in the state of Oklahoma. Senate Bill 612, which uh, cleared the state Senate last year, makes performing an abortion or attempting to perform one a felony punishable by a maximum fine of $100,000 or a maximum of 10 years in state prison or both. The law does not provide exceptions in cases of rape and incest. Under the measure, the woman would not be criminally charged or convicted for the death of her unborn child. The legislation does not prohibit the use, sale, prescription, or administration of contraceptives. Uh, and, of course, and, and even some people who, who call themselves, claim to be pro-lifers, are critical of the fact that there are no exceptions for um, rape and incest and, and, uh, and those kinds of extreme, you know, uh, very rare cases. Well, but you, you can't put an exception. If you're going to outlaw abortion, there can't be an exception. One reason is just from a practical standpoint, how do you, in, how do you enforce that? If you say, oh, abortion is um, illegal unless you tell us that you were raped, well, there's, 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 there's what's the enforcement, enforcement mechanism there? But more importantly, the only reason to make abortion illegal is that uh, the child in the womb is a human being and has human rights. And it is not okay to intentionally directly kill an innocent human being. That's the only reason to make abortion illegal. It's the best reason. It's the only reason. It's the only reason you need. And if that's the case, that the, um, the person in the womb is a person and has human rights and ought to have legal rights as well, codifying those human rights, which they naturally have by the nature of the fact that they are human beings, uh, if that's the case, then you, it, it doesn't make any sense to say that, oh yeah, well, they have human rights unless they were conceived in a certain way, in which case the rights don't, don't hold anymore. Now, you want to punish somebody for rape, punish the rapist, not the baby. But we're starting to see this more and more from, from some in the Republican Party, going, going on offense more. We know what's happening in Florida and some other states as well, whether, whether it's the gender issue or abortion. Don't just sit around and say that, well, there's a, we, we got to wait for the Supreme Court to speak before we can do anything. No, if you're pro-life, then you believe that actual human beings, children, are being systematically slaughtered in this country, which means you have to do everything in your power to stop it. And let the other side challenge you, let them take you to court, do whatever they're going to do. You're under no obligation to respect Roe v. Wade. Roe v. Wade holds no moral weight whatsoever. It's not legitimate. It's not morally legitimate, which means that if you're the governor of the state, if you're a state legislator, you can ignore it and just do what you're going to do. Let them take you to court over it, which is what they're doing in Oklahoma, uh, which is exactly what they should do. All right. One other thing. This is just some, uh, some good news. More good news, actually. From CNBC, fewer than 10,000 people are using CNN Plus on a daily basis two weeks into its existence, according to people familiar with the matter. People spoke with us, CNBC, on the condition of anonymity. CNN Plus, uh, that's their streaming service, it launched on March 29th. The subscription news streaming service, which charges $5.99 a month, or um, about 60 bucks annually, only became available on Roku on Monday. Still is available on Android, Android TV. And right now, there's it's a big crisis at CNN because they've got, they've got 10,000 people using their streaming service. Which, I mean, at least that, that's more people than um, watch their normal network programming, especially when you take airports out of the equation. So you could look at it from a positive angle like that, I guess. But also not a surprise. You know, you actually have to give people a reason to subscribe. You have to give them content that they want to see, which I think CNN, they, they tended to neglect that part of this equation. Let's get now to the comment section. Makes a Twitter mob fly off the handle with rage. Who's to blame? It's a sweet baby game. 
Ding. Nick C says, I love how Matt's segues between topics are usually just him staring silently at the camera for a couple of seconds. Alex says, from the previous show, I was almost diagnosed with ADHD, but my parents came in and said, no, you're not going to go on drugs because you don't fix a five-year-old kid's unwillingness to sit down in a classroom for eight hours a day with pills. Well, I'm glad that your parents at least saw that. Uh, I wish that more parents would because the fact that a, that a young child has difficulty sitting still in a public school environment, that's not an indication that there's anything wrong with them. As I always say, this is a, that that's, if there's something wrong here, if there's a disorder, it's in the system itself that ex- expects kids to learn that way because most kids cannot, and, and, and especially boys cannot learn that way. If you just sit them down at a, at a desk for seven or eight hours a day and give them busy work to complete, there's a, there's a minority of kids, and most of them girls, who can thrive in that environment. But it's a very specific sort of environment that presents challenges to most people. I, I couldn't even do it now at this age. Um, but kids, especially especially boys, can't. Doesn't mean that they're disordered. It means that there's a problem with the system itself. Um, Anna says, why can't we flip the why do you even care argument around? I'm a woman. If a trans person called me a man, I wouldn't care. So why do they even care? Yeah, I mean, that's, and that's an important point. It's the same thing for me. Like, if I, I, I'm a man. I'm aware that I'm a man. I'm quite confident in that. I don't depend on anybody else affirming me in my manhood. And so if somebody said that I was a woman, I would just, it, I, I, it would be embarrassing for them to say that. It wouldn't cause any kind of crisis for me. I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't have any identity crisis because they said that. It wouldn't cause me to plunge into despair Anything like that. Because I know who I am and you, Anna, know who you are. What we find this is part of gender ideology is that your you are um, your identity is a very tenuous thing. And it it requires that in order for it to for it to kind of be held up intact, it requires that everyone around you constantly affirm it. And if one person fails to affirm it, then the whole thing shatters to pieces. And that should probably tell you something about your perception of yourself, which is that it's probably not exactly accurate. Um, Let's see. Meredith says, uh, or rather, Cool Papa J Magic says, just in case any of you didn't know, separation of church and state was meant to prevent the state from influencing the church, not the other way around. Uh, that That is actually accurate. That's how it was originally used when Thomas Jefferson used it um, in his letter that he wrote to the Baptists, uh, it was about, it was the, the concern that if church and state intermingle, it's not that it's going to cause corruption of the state, but it will cause corruption of the church. A little historical note that I think is important. And Joyful Catholicism says, Matt, I've been adding, if you think Matt Walsh from The Daily Wire is hilarious, we'll probably get along just fine to all of my online dating profiles. It's been a great conversation starter. Thanks for all your help. Wish me luck in finding a good Catholic man. Uh, I do like that. I think that's good. I think, I think you know, maybe go a little bit farther. Requiring your date to make an SBG loyalty pledge is probably the way to go. And the good thing is it'll really whittle down your candidates. I mean, really whittle them down a lot. You'll probably scare away like 99% who will have no idea what you're talking about. But that makes selection a lot simpler. So that's the good thing. Well, there's no question that leftism has been a disaster. I am uh, opposed to leftism. I don't know if you noticed that yet, but that's a little known fact about me. That's why we're discussing it all on a very special episode of Backstage Tonight. Not only will your favorite Daily Wire host be there to break down the current state of our country, but we'll also be welcoming a special guest. That's why you should tune in to catch an all-new episode of us discussing what's happening and how we're actively fighting it on Backstage Tonight with myself, Ben Shapiro, Jeremy Boring, Michael Knowles and Andrew Clavin. It streams tonight at 7 o'clock Eastern, 6 p.m. Central on dailywire.com and our YouTube channel, Daily Wire. Don't miss it. And if you're not a member yet, time is running out to head to dailywire.com slash subscribe and use code BUILDTHEFUTURE for 45% off your membership. This offer ends tomorrow, so don't miss out. Now let's get to our daily cancellation. Cole and Savannah LeBrant are a husband and wife duo, parents of uh, three kids, extremely successful YouTubers. Their channel, The LeBrant Fam, it's called, has over 13 million subscribers. Most of their videos are dedicated to marriage, family life, other crowd-pleasing kinds of topics. 
which have earned them a large mainstream audience comprised of people from all across the political spectrum. And so it took real courage then to upload their latest video, which is a 38-minute documentary titled simply Abortion. In the video, they correctly dub abortion the world's most deadly killer, and they compare abortion, the abortion death toll, to all of the worst genocides in history, including the Rwandan genocide, the Cambodian genocide, the Holocaust. The 60 million deaths from abortion far outstrip the other three combined, times three. They interview uh, doctors, pro-life activists, uh, medical professionals, and others about the topic. They also say that the money they raise from the video, which should be a pretty substantial sum as it already has 2 million views, they're going to give that money to a pregnancy center. So this is all, again, quite courageous, admirable, and true. And if we know anything about our culture, it's that if you do something courageous, admirable, and true, then you're guaranteed to be ripped to, ripped to shreds for it, which is indeed what Cole and Savannah have experienced. Uh, media outlets like the Daily Mail have fanned the outrage flames with headlines like this. Sickening YouTube star couple is slammed for comparing abortion to the Holocaust and branding it the world's most deadly killer. Meanwhile, leftist blogs like Jezebel have been even more direct. YouTube couple shares disgusting video comparing abortion to the Holocaust. The LeBrant fam, who have more than 13 million subscribers, posted anti-abortion propaganda that left viewers enraged and questioning why YouTube allowed it. Now, YouTube is allowing it, quote-unquote, for now, but their video has apparently already been taken down by Instagram, so Instagram isn't allowing it. As for the enraged viewers, that is true as well. All you have to do is look up Savannah LeBrant's name on Twitter, and you'll see the sort of uh, backlash they're dealing with. So reading now just the first few tweets that pop up, just to give you an idea. Um, one of them says, as someone who has had an abortion, Savannah LeBrant can quite literally go F herself. How dare you, as a woman, think it is your right to tell others what to do with their own bodies? You grew up rich and married a rich man who could help you raise your child. You are not. Next, someone else says, F Cole and Savannah LeBrant. F them. And then, I hope Cole and Savannah LeBrant choke. And also, Cole and Savannah LeBrant can rot, to be honest. How dare you, a privileged white family with no financial issues and no hardships in the entire world, compare abortions to the Holocaust in an attempt at guilt-tripping women who have had abortions and to push your own crappy religious agenda. Now, in fact, I scrolled down a good way, and I, I didn't see even one single post defending them. All of it is negative, viciously negative. But that, of course, doesn't change the fact that they're right. Abortion is a holocaust in its own right. And in terms of sheer body count, count, it is the worst holocaust in the history of the world. That is the inevitable conclusion that you must draw if you believe that children in the womb are human beings. Every pro-life person must believe that abortion is the deadliest holocaust in history. Because that is the in, absolutely inescapable conclusion that follows directly from the belief that the victims of abortion are human beings. Now, of course, I call it a belief, but our belief that humans in the womb are, are human is similar to our belief that gravity exists and that like two plus two equals four. There's no leap of faith required in this belief. It is belief not in, an, in some sort of assumption, but in a fact. The entity in the womb of a woman is a being because he exists and he is human because he was conceived by humans. Thus, he is a human being. And we know that he's alive because the whole point of the abortion is to make him not alive anymore. Thus, he is a living human being. Abortion is the direct intentional murder of a living human being. This kind of murder has been carried out systematically and brutally. There's no non-brutal way to do it. Over 60 million times since Roe v. Wade. 60 million systemic murders is a genocide. It is a holocaust. Again, this is inescapable. No matter how it may make you feel to hear it is inescapable. Now, in order to disprove or debunk the Holocaust claim, you would need to, rather than cry and whine and do the whole how dare you routine, you would need to demonstrate that the human in the womb is not a human or else was not alive before he was killed or else that somehow killing an innocent and defenseless human being doesn't count as murder. You can't demonstrate or prove any of that. Nobody ever has. The pro-abortion side barely even attempts because they know the attempt will be futile. So instead, they just flail about like demonically possessed lunatics, hoping that it passes for an argument. It doesn't. The LeBrants are therefore vindicated. Or at least they would be if they stuck to their guns. But this is where we get to the tragic, though not at all surprising, end of the story. Savannah so LeBrant um, seems to have deleted all of her tweets. But before she deleted them, according to the Daily Mail, she posted this, quote, 
We didn't mean it in a hurtful way or anything. I do understand nothing should be compared to something like the Holocaust. I didn't go through, I, I didn't go through to edit the video. Cole edits most of our videos that are uploaded. I do apologize for any hurtful things the video has done. The uploading of this video was to show how we plan to help anyone going through something or thinking of an abortion and to show our view. I totally do agree with you on it being presented in another way. As a mime, uh, mom, I'm still learning from things, and I do hope to learn from this on future document documentaries that we do. Damn it, Savannah. So not only does she apologize and backtrack, but she actually throws her husband under the bus. It's the groveling trifecta. Now, on one hand, you may be far more generous than me, and you may be willing to cut the LeBrant some slack. They were facing an onslaught of attacks. Uh, they're no doubt panicked that they may have just alienated a significant portion of their audience, and they're reacting out of fear. You may be willing to forgive the groveling in that case. You may be willing to. I am not. Because nobody told the LeBrants that they had to make a video about abortion. They could have just kept posting sappy, heartwarming, hallmark stuff, uh, the kind of stuff that's made them successful to this point. Could have just done that. But if you're going to tread into these waters, then you, you have a responsibility to stand firm by your convictions. I'm so tired of people saying the right thing and then backing down immediately. It's like we're still supposed to give them credit. No, I give you zero credit. I give you zero credit on the assignment. All of the credit you would get for speaking up immediately evaporates the moment you apologize. It's done. It's not just like you have zero. It's actually negative now because it's better to say nothing. It's much, much better to say nothing than to say the right thing only to apologize for it later. Because when you apologize, you are in effect retracting the truth you spoke and you're validating your insane, rabid, foaming at the mouth critics and you're emboldening those same rabid dogs only further ensuring that they treat the next person just as they treated you. If you aren't prepared and willing to stare down the mob and tell these hyenas to screw off, then please just keep your mouth shut to begin with. But as I said, this isn't surprising. Uh, there were warning signs in the video itself. Moments, you know, when, you, when you watch the video, where, where it seemed that maybe the LeBrants weren't fully invested in the pro-life cause or, or maybe aware of what the pro-life cause even is. Moments like this. As we've been filming this documentary, we've been asked by our friends, by family, by mentors, why are we making this? There's so much at risk. Why are we even making this? Why are we adding flame to an already crazy burning fire? And the answer is just, if one baby is saved from this, if one mom chooses to keep her baby from it, then it's all worth it. Mm -hmm. This documentary by no means is trying to illegalize abortion. After this documentary, you're still gonna have the choice. Yeah. You're still gonna have your choice. But I know that there's gonna be one mom watching, maybe five, maybe 10, maybe 100, maybe 1,000. We have no idea the ripple effects. But just for you guys to know all the resources out there, and also for us as a church and just just me and Cole even, just that how much more we need to be doing. Well, obviously the documentary itself isn't going to illegalize abortion, but are you saying that you don't want abortion to be illegal? That seems to be what they're saying, especially given Savannah's response to her critics on Twitter. We've already gone over her apology, but there was also this. Somebody tweeted at her saying, uh, quote, how disgusting of you guys to make a video like that. It's a choice, my body, my effing choice. The fact you tried comparing the Holocaust to abortions is absolutely concerning. That wasn't a choice. People were ripped from their homes. Now, Savannah should have responded to that by reminding this person that in abortion, babies are also ripped from their homes, which are in the womb, and then ripped apart limb from limb. But instead, she came back with a smiley face and this statement. She said, we clearly stated in the video, it's still your choice. Huh? So abortion is a holocaust. It's the murder of 60 million human babies, and yet it should still be a choice? And you don't want to make it illegal? You don't want the Holocaust to be illegal? At another point in the film, they say that they aren't pro-life or pro-choice, but pro-love. Wait, what, but why aren't you pro-life? Isn't that the whole point of opposing abortion? Are you, what, taking a neutral stance on the Holocaust of infants? There's a certain lack of commitment in the way that they framed things here. And that probably explains why they cracked under the pressure and apologized and deleted their entire social media presence. They were ready to go halfway for the pro-life cause, which, granted, is, is, is farther than a lot of people are willing to go, but it's not good enough. Halfway is not going to do it. You got to go the whole way. They thought a half measure would be good enough. It isn't. 
Because this fight is real. Real. You either go all in and you come ready for the war or you stay home and stay out of it. So they thought they could just dip their toes in the pool but not dive all the way in. They were wrong. And for that reason, sadly, at the end of this, it must be them today who are canceled. And we'll leave it there. Thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. Have a great day. Godspeed. The Matt Wall Show is produced by Sean Hampton, executive producer Jeremy Boring. Our supervising producer is Mathis Glover, production manager Pavel Vodowski. Our associate producer is McKenna Waters. The show is edited by Robbie Dantzler. Our audio is mixed by Mike Cormina. And hair and makeup is done by Cherokee Hart. The Matt Wall Show is a Daily Wire production. Copyright Daily Wire 2022. Today on the Ben Shapiro Show, Joe Biden tries to brush off inflation, but gets pooped on by a bird. Plus, Hollywood won't say gay in China. That's today on the Ben Shapiro Show. Give it a listen. Mm-hmm.